Namaskaram. Um, that was uh, Sadhuam singing um, verse 11 of Sri Arunachakshram Lai, which is the verse that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, what Bhagavan says in this verse is, I'm Bula Kalva, Ahatilni Puhumbo, Dahatilni Ileo Arunachala. Um, the basic meaning of that is, or the literal meaning is, Arunachala, when the five sense thieves enter the heart, are you not in the heart? Um, and what it implies is when the five sense thieves, namely the Vishaya Vasanas, which are the seeds that sprout as desires for the pleasures that are seemingly derived from the five kinds of sense objects, enter my heart uh, to steal my attention away from you, are you not in my heart? So why do you not protect me from them? That is the implication. Um, the, the first um, syllable of this verse is Ein. Uh, ein do means five, and in compound with certain nouns, it becomes Ein. So Ein here means five. Pullen or pullum both mean either a sense impression, that is an object perceived through the senses, or a sense organ. But the compound word Ein pullen or Ein pullum uh, both specifically mean the five kinds of sense impression or, or sense objects, namely sights, sounds, uh, uh, tastes, smells, and tactile sensations. Due to our Vishaya Vasanas, which are our inclinations to seek happiness in objects or phenomena, in other words, in Vishayas, these five kinds of sense impressions lure our attention away from our fundamental awareness, I am, which is Aranachala, to whom we rightfully belong. So Bhagavan describes them here as Aimbula Kalva, the five sense thieves, in which the word Kalva is a plural form of, of Kalvan, which means a thief or one who steals, being derived from the verb Kal, which means to weed, pluck, rob, steal, or deceive. Um, so that's the first, uh, um, the, the first uh, group of words is Aimbula Kalba, the five sense thieves. Then the next word is Ahatinil, which is a locative form of Aham, which in this case is not the Sanskrit pronoun I, it's, the, it's a Tamil word that means inside, mind, heart, house or home. Uh, so it means in the mind, in the heart or in the home implying in my mind or in my heart. Um, puhum is an adjectival participle of the verb puhu, which means to reach, enter, go in or come in. And podu is a noun that means time. Well, as a noun, it means time. And as an adverb in this case, uh, it means when, while or during. So ahatilni puhum bodu means when they... Uh, they meaning the five sense thieves, when they come in or enter my heart, um, my heart or my mind or, or home. Um, then the, the final uh, clause is ahatil nilio. Ahatil is um, like, like le, sorry, le, like ahatinil in the previous uh, clause, ahatil is a locative form, it's an alternative locative form of aham. So it means in the heart or in the home. And in this case, it implies in my heart, which is your home. Uh, ni uh, mean, is, uh, is the simple uh, nominative form of uh, 
second person singular pronoun, so it means you. And uh, ileo is an interrogative form of ile, which is a poetic abbreviation of ille, uh, which is a verb but negates existence, and therefore in this context means are not. Um, that is, when I say it negates existence, in, in Tamil there are two negatives. There's ille and Allah. If you say ille, you're denying the existence of something. If you say Allah, you're denying a quality. Um, so uh, if the answer is, if, if a question is, uh, does something exist? The answer is ille. If, if, um, if uh, the question is something like, um, is he a good person? The answer, if he's not a good person, the answer is Allah. Allah means no. It, it's denying the, the quality of being good, whereas ille is denying the existence. So ille uh, denies existence. So in this context, it means are not. Um, so ahatil nili ileo is a rhetorical question that means, are you not in my heart? Um, and as Murugana points out in his commentary on this verse, the implied meaning of this question, are you not in my heart, is a double negative. You are not not in my heart, or you have never ceased to be in my heart which is a very emphatic way of asserting you most certainly are in my heart. So the overall meaning is, when the five sense thieves enter my heart, are you not in my heart? Um, so, and, uh, the implication is that our, even when the five sense thieves enter our heart, our nature is most certainly there. That is, as ego, we are always aware of ourselves as I am this body. But what we actually are is only the fundamental awareness I am, and that is our natural. He is therefore the heart or reality of ourself. So he is not only always in our heart, but is our heart itself. That is, in the, in the mixed awareness, I am this body, the heart or reality, the substance, is only I am. That is our natural. So our natural is our very heart. How then can he ever leave our heart even for a moment? Without first being aware of ourselves as I am, how could we ever be aware of ourselves as I am this body? The awareness I am this body, which is ego, is a false awareness of ourself because it appears in waking and dream but disappears in sleep. But whether it appears or disappears, we never cease to be aware of ourselves as I am. So this fundamental awareness I am, in its pure and pristine condition, devoid of all adjuncts such as this or that, uh, alone is what is real. And hence it is the reality and substance, not only of ourself, but also of our natural, as Bhagavan implies in verse 24 of Rupadesha Undia. What he says in verse 24 of Rupadesha Undia is, Irakum ekeal isa jivagal, that means, by existing nature, God and soul are just one substance. Only adjunct awareness is different. And what that implies is, by their existing nature, that is because the real nature of each of them is what actually exists, uladu or sat, which is pure awareness, unavu or chit, God and soul are just one substance. The word he used in Tamil for substance is poral, which is a Tamil equivalent of uh, the Sanskrit word vastu. So it means the, the substance. Just like gold is the substance of all gold ornaments, uh, the, the substance of our soul from God is a one. And then in the last sentence, he says, um, only adjunct awareness is different. What that implies is only awareness of their adjuncts is what makes them seem different. That is, because we identify ourselves as a body, we take ourselves to be a person, we seem to be something different from God. Um, but it's only because of um, uh, our identifying ourselves with these adjuncts rather than with the real substance that we actually are, but we, um, but we seem to be different to God. That is, whereas the soul is aware of itself as a certain set of adjuncts, namely the five sheaths that constitute whatever person it currently seems to be, 
and consequently uh, uh, attributes certain ad other adjuncts to God, God always remains a pure awareness in the clearer view of which there are no, no adjuncts exist at all. And in the absence of adjuncts, obviously there's no differences. It's only the adjuncts that make us seem different. Um, <clears throat> what he refers to here as irakum irke, existing nature, and as oruporo, one substance, both of these, uh, 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 both of these uh, mean, or what he's referring to as uh, both of these, is satchit. That means pure existence awareness, which is what always shines in our heart as our fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. So this alone is what both God, what, what both Aranachala, uh, namely God or Isa, and we, namely ego, soul, or jiva, actually are. Um, this is therefore what the heart in its deepest sense means. Arunachala is therefore our heart, the fundamental awareness I am. So how could he ever leave our heart even for the twinkling of an eye? Um, this uh, rhetorical question, Ahatil Nihileo, uh, are you not in my heart, Arunachala? Which, as I say, it implies you're always in my heart. It is therefore a great assurance to us and also a powerful reminder that we should always try to lovingly attend to him in our heart as I am. Because though he is always ready to eradicate uh, the ego of each and every one of his devotees, he will not do so until we give our consent by surrendering ourselves entirely to him, which we can do only by meditating on him deep in our heart as I am, as Bhagavan implied in the very first verse of this love song, in which he sang, Arunachala mena ahameinine pava ahateva rupai Arunachala. Arunachala, you will eradicate the egos of those that think that Arunachala is actually I. That implies you will eradicate or root out the egos of those who think deep within the heart or mind, because in this context, the second word of this word, or the third word, ahame, means both actually I, it also means in the heart. So it's got a double meaning. So you will eradicate the ego of those who think deep within the heart or mind, but Arunacha is actually I, or that Arunacha alone is I. Um, since he alone is the true import of the word I, he always exists and shines clearly in our heart, even when the five sense thieves enter it. Why then does he not prevent them? When the owner of the house is present there, will he allow thieves to enter unobstructed to steal anything? If he is lacking in manliness, that is, in strength and courage, he may. But Arunacha never lacks manliness, because his manliness, Bhagavan referred to in a couple of verses earlier, is his arrow shakti, his, the supreme power of his grace. So he has both the strength and courage to repel all intruders. Or if the owner of the house uh, is asleep, thieves may have the courage to enter stealthily, to steal his possessions. But Arunacha is pure awareness, which can never sleep. So when he is eternally present and awake in our heart, why does he allow, allow the five sense thieves to enter and steal our attention away from him? This is what Bhagavan implies by asking rebukingly in this verse, uh, when Arunachala, when the five sense thieves enter my heart, are you not in my heart? Since he is eternally present in our heart, shining immutably as the, as the ever unsleeping awareness of being, I am, and since the power of grace, Arul Shakti, is his very nature, who or what could ever enter our heart unknown to him or without his consent? Therefore, if others, en if others enter to steal our attention away from him, 
This must be his trickery, as Bhagavan sings in the next verse, namely verse 12. What he says in that ver- the next verse is, Oruvana munne oli teva varuva unsu deidu arunachala. That means Arunachala hiding you who are the one who can come. This is only your trick. That implies Arunachala hiding from you who are the only one, the one who alone actually exists. That is the one without a second. Ekameva advaitiam. Who can come into my heart? This, the entry of the five sheaves in my, in my heart, the entry of the five sense thieves in my heart is only or certainly your trick. So why does Arunacha play such a trick on us? He has no intention to trick us, but he is our own real nature, Atma Sarupa, and his power is Aral Chit Shakti. Uh, that, that is the power Shakti, of pure awareness, chit, which is grace, arul. So even though we have seemingly, so sorry, so even though we have seemingly limited ourselves by rising as ego, the false awareness, I am this body, we are never actually anything other than him. And hence, within the boundaries of our, our own self-imposed limitations, we are free to use his arul chit shakti in any way we wish. That is, his arrow chit shakti is reflected in us as our power of knowing. So whatever we know, we know only by means of this power. And our limited ability to know whatever we want to know is what we call our power of attention. That is, our power of attention is a a selective power of knowing. We choose to, when many things are presented to us, we choose to attend to one thing rather than to other things. That means we choose to know one thing rather than other things. So the power of attention in us is a reflection of that, his Aral Chit Shakti, his uh, supreme power of pure awareness, which is grace. Um, that's why uh, in um, the Patha Sri Ramana, Sadhu Om says, attention itself is grace. The more you attend to, th- to something, the larger it looms in your, um, in your awareness. If you take, if you, if there's some particular thing that interests you, so your, might, your attention is always dwelling on that, that will become more and more and more important. Um, this is how... I mean, we, we see this in so many ways. We can see it in our own experience, but it's also how, um, for example, phobias or, or uh, fears or obsessions, how all these operate is because the more we allow our mind to dwell on something, the more we, we bestow the, the, the grace of that chit shakti, that power of knowing, that power of awareness on something, the larger and larger it looms in our awareness. Um, so at each moment, we are free to attend either to ourself or to something else. In the past, we have been constantly misusing this freedom by attending to countless other things, namely vishayas, objects or phenomena, and therefore we have cultivated strong vishaya vasanas, inclinations to attend to and to experience things other than ourselves. This is why we allow these five sense these to enter our heart, and Arunachal will not prevent them so long as we choose to allow them to enter. His grace works through us by cultivating in our heart the love to attend to ourselves, and thus he gradually weans us off our Vishaya Vasanas. The more we attend to ourselves, the weaker our Vishaya Vasanas become. That is, the Vasanas have no strength of their own. Whatever strength any vasana seems to have, it is strength, but it it uh, it uh, it uh, derives from us. That is, the more we allow ourselves to be swayed by any particular vishaya vasana, the stronger that vishaya vasana will become. Uh, so it, it's deriving its strength from us. So if instead of attending to any vishayas, we attend only to ourselves, uh, our vishaya vasanas will become weaker and weaker. So he, 
uh, so uh, our nature protects us from the deceptive tricks of the five sense thieves by giving us more and more love to attend to ourselves, thereby enabling us to exclude them from our heart. The five sense thieves can enter our heart only when we allow our attention to go outwards, because our outward going attention is the only door or opening through which they can enter. That is, if we never attended to any uh, any uh, vishayas, any objects, any sense objects, or any objects of any sort, there'd be no chance for them to enter our heart. They enter our heart because we attend to them. So our attending to them is the doorway through which they enter. Um, so if we leave the door of our house open, they, we can't complain if the thieves enter. We're inviting them in by when there are thieves prowling around outside. If we leave the door of our house open, we're inviting the thieves to enter. Likewise, if we allow our attention to go outwards, we're inviting these five sense thieves to enter. Um, as I explained above, what Bhagavan means by the term Ein Kalva, the five sense thieves, is the five kinds of Indriya Vishayas. Uh, that means the sense impressions or sense objects, namely sights, sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile sensations. But though these, uh, these vishayas lure our attention away from ourself, the real fault does not lie with the vishayas themselves, but uh, only with our vasanas, our inclinations or likings to attend to and experience them. Therefore, though the term Aimbula Kalva, the five sense thieves, superficially refers to the vishayas that we're able to perceive through the window of our five sense organs. In a deeper sense, it, it is actually a metonym for our vishaya vasanas, which are the inclinations under whose sway we allow our attention to be drawn away from ourselves towards those vishayas. In other words, the five sense thieves and are not actually the sense objects, the shares themselves, but our inclinations to seek happiness in them instead of in ourself, where alone we can actually find the unalloyed, infinite and eternal happiness that we are all naturally and constantly seeking because it's our very nature. Um, that is, we should be seeking happiness within ourselves because happiness exists. Happiness is our very nature. It doesn't exist outside. But uh, we wrongly believe that the happiness exists outside, and so we've got strong inclination to seek happiness in external objects. So Bhagavan refers to these vasanas as, as the sense thieves. Describing our vishaya vasanas thus as Aimbula Kalva, the five sense thieves, is appropriate because by their very nature, they steal our attention away from ourselves dragging it outwards to seek happiness in the objects of the world. And the world consists of nothing other than I'm, uh, I'm Pulangal, uh, the five kinds of sense impressions or sense objects. As Bhagavan says in verse 6 of Uludunapadu, uh, what he says in the first sentence of verse 6 of Uludunapadu is, Uluhu I'm Pulangal Uru, Verandru. The world is a form of five sense impressions, not anything else. Five sense impressions implies the five kinds of sense impressions. So we, what did the world consist of? It consists of, that is, what we experience as the world is just a set of five kinds of uh, perceptions, sights or, or perceptual um, impressions, sense impressions, sights, sounds, uh, tastes, uh, tactile sensations and smells. If we remove all of these, where is any world? There's no world other than these five kinds of sense impressions. That's what Bhagavan is asserting there. In other words, the world is nothing but our own perception of it. Um, this is what is called uh, drishti shrishti vada. Just like in a dream, nothing we perceive in a dream has any existence independent of our perception of it. This world does not exist independent of our perception of it, and our perception of it consists of these five kinds of sense impressions. Um, 
since I'm Bulla Kalba, the five sense thieves, is a metonym for Abishaya Vasanas, I'm Bulla Kalba, Ahatilni Puhum Bodu, when the five sense thieves enter my heart, is a metaphorical way of saying when these Vishaya Vasanas rise in my heart and steal my attention away from you. Therefore, the implied meaning of this verse, I'm Bulla Kalba, Ahatilni Puhum Dahatilni Eleo Arunachala, Arunachala, when the five sense thieves enter my heart, are you not in my heart? The implied meaning is, Arunachala, when the five sense thieves, namely the Vishaya Vasanas, which are the seeds that sprout as desires for the pleasures that are seemingly derived from the five kinds of sense objects, um, enter my heart to steal my attention away from you, are you not in my heart? And why do you not protect me from them? When Why do you not protect me from is not asked explicitly there, but that the, that's the, what Bhagavan is implying here. That is, since he's present in our heart, why doesn't he protect us from them? Um, Arunacha certainly does protect us from these thieves but he does so in the only way that is effective and permanent, namely by silently sowing in our heart the seed of love to turn within and hold fast to being self-attentive. And by nurturing this uh, seed so that it grows stronger and stronger until eventually it becomes so strong that it pulls us back into the innermost depth of our heart uh, where he is waiting to devour us. All this he does through us and from within our own heart. So all we need to do is cooperate with him uh, by trying patiently and persistently to be self-attentive as much as we can. That is, our cooperation is necessary because it's through us that our nature works. Our nature will never force anything on us. So our willingness is necessary. So he's working by sowing this, uh, the seed of this love to attend to ourselves. He's sown this in our heart, and now he is nurturing it. We have to cooperate with him by trying persistently and patiently to be self-attentive as much as we can. The more we hold fast to being self-attentive, the more we are thereby preventing the five sense thieves from entering our heart, because we're not allowing our attention to go out, so they cannot come in. But the more we exclude them in this way, the more they will try to enter. Because entering our heart to steal our attention away from ourselves is their very livelihood, without which they cannot survive. By clinging to self-attentiveness, we are depriving them of their livelihood. So they become so so they become progressively weaker. But the weaker they become, the more ferociously they will fight for our attention because our attention is their food, without which they would, will wither and die. Therefore, the battle with these sense thieves, namely our Vishaya Vasanas, will continue raging in our heart until we surrender ourselves entirely to our natural by being so keenly and firmly self-attentive that we thereby sink back into the innermost depth of our heart where he is always waiting to welcome and swallow us. This war between our sattvasana, our love to hold fast to our own being, I am, and thereby to just to be as we actually are. So this war between the sattvasana and the vast army of our Vishaya vasanas is actually being fought by grace, because grace alone is what appears in our heart as sattvasana. So it is. So it's fighting this war is what Bhagavan refers to as aroporatum, the warfare of grace in verse seventy four of Akshram Lai. What he sings in verse seventy four is, "Pokum varavumil poduveli inilaro pora tanka taranachala, aranachala in the common space devoid of coming and going, show the warfare of grace." This is a very simple prayer, but it has a very, very deep implication. Um, uh, That is, when he says in the common space, what he means by common is it is natural and all-pervading. That is, it is common to all of us. It is the space 
but is within each one of us, and we are within e within that. That is, it is the all-pervading space, uh, which is the the space that we that e that each and everything occupies, and it occupies each and everything. So that's why he says it. He describes it as poduvali, the common space. So, what is that common space? Um, uh, and he said the common space is. He describes it as pokum varavumil, a devoid of 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 poku means going, a varavu means coming, devoid of going and coming. So, what is this common space that is devoid of going and coming? It is our heart. The infinite and eternally immutable space of pure awareness, which never goes in the sense that it never ceases to exist, and it never comes in the sense that it never begins to exist or never comes into existence, because it's eternal, it's ever ex existing. And also, that, that's one implication we have to take from pokum varavum, the void of going and coming, but that space itself never goes or comes. And also, in that space, once we know that space as our own real nature, we will know that we have, we have never gone out of it anywhere, and we've never come back. So, in fact, no such thing as ego has ever risen or has ever subsided. So, pokum varovumil, Bhagavan is pointing here towards the state of ajata, which is the state of that of the heart, the, the state of of uh, pure awareness. Ajata means that which is never born, has never come and never goes. It eternally shines without ever undergoing any change at all. So that is what he means by pokum varavumi poduvali in 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 this in this common space devoid of coming and going. In other words, in our own heart, um uh arul poratum uh, uh, kartu, uh, show the warfare of grace. What, what does he mean by show the warfare of grace? That is, this warfare of grace is the warfare between uh, grace on the one hand and the, uh, the enemy army, which is the army of ego and its army of Vishaya Vasanas. So, um, why does Bhagavan ask to be shown this warfare? Because this warfare but is now being fought by Arunachala, he will never cease fighting this war. He's, that is, why is he fighting this war? He's fighting the war to save us, to save us from our own, from ego and its Vishaya Vasanas. So in this uh, warfare of grace, he will never cease fighting to save us until he achieves victory, uh, destroying in us the vast army of demons, namely ego and all its Vishaya Vasanas. So, um, as I say, there's a huge amount of implication, and it's a very, very important verse, because before we can know what we actually are, we first need to go through this warfare. We need to be subjected to this warfare. We need to experience this warfare in our heart, a warfare between grace on the one hand, which shines in us in the form of sattvas and of a love to know ourselves as we actually are, also called Swatma Bhakti, and on the other hand, the Vishayavas and all our likings to go outwards. So we we all have to go through this war. We all have to experience this war. Because only after experiencing this war to its conclusion can we experience ourselves as we actually are. So that's why Bhagavan uh, prays to be shown this warfare of grace. Um and he's asking to see that with the full confidence that Aaron actually is always fighting this war and will never cease fighting it until he saves us, which is his aim. And in other words, until he destroys in us a vast army of demons, namely ego and all its Vishaya Vasanas. Um, Bhagavan often used to uh, compare the Vishaya Vasanas to, an, to the enemy army. Uh, in Nana and elsewhere. I'll refer to that later. Um, so, until grace is, a, is victorious in this war, annihilating ego along with all its Vishaya Vasanas, this war that, is, that it is waging in our heart will not cease. 
some wars begin with small skirmishes and minor battles fought infrequently between the opposing sides. But one thing leads to another, so the warfare gradually becomes more fierce and persistent until it becomes an all-out and unceasing struggle by both sides for total victory. Such is the nature of this war fought by grace in our heart. When grace first draws us into this war by sowing in our heart the seed of love to surrender ourselves and thereby to know and to be what we actually are, we begin by fighting rather half-heartedly and intermittently. But as this love uh, that grace is nurturing in our heart grows stronger and stronger, we gradually get drawn deeper and deeper into this warfare, trying with ever greater perseverance and intensity to cling firmly to being self-attentive. However, the more we persevere in trying to be self-attentive, the more fiercely our Vishaya Vasanas fight back, striving to draw our attention away from ourselves towards other things. So as we go progressively deeper in this path of self-investigation of self-surrender, this war that is being fought by grace on our behalf against ego and its army of Vishaya Vasanas becomes increasingly intense and unceasing. Um, in this context, I'll just say something about what is the role of ego in this war. Um, there's a saying in English, um, uh, running with the hare, or running with, yeah, running with the hare and hunting with the hounds. That means being on both sides. The hare is being chased by the hounds. So we're running with the hare. That means we're on the side of the hare. We're also running with the hounds. That is, ego is 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 on both sides in this battle. That is, insofar as we have liking to surrender ourselves, ego is fight, is on the side of grace. But insofar as we are not willing to let go of all our Vishaya Vasanas, it's on the opposing side. So um, e ego is 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 fighting on both sides, so to speak. So what is ego? We are ego. So we have to choose which side in this battle we're on. If we want to remain on the side of um, the Vishaya Vasanas, the war isn't really being fought. It's only when we, when, we, uh, when we begin to cooperate with grace that the war really gets underway. So um, though this is a fight, a warfare being fought against ego and its army of Vishaya Vasanas, ego's cooperation, ego's willingness to cooperate with grace is absolutely essential. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, what I was saying was this war that is there by being fought by grace on our behalf against ego, it becomes increasingly intense and unceasing. This is clearly illustrated by Bhagavan in this Aksharam Rai, which he sang from the perspective of a very advanced aspirant, namely one who has intense love to surrender herself completely and immediately. As we can see, for example, in verses uh, 11, uh, 7 to 11, that is, these are the verses we've done, the five verses we've discussed in the last five weeks, including this week. In the middle, or, uh, in verses 7 to 11, the middle verse is verse 9. And in verse 9, she clearly expresses the intensity of her love to be destroyed now at this very moment so that she can be inseparably and eternally one with him. What she sings in uh, in verse 9 is, Ene yari tippo dene kalababidil idu wo an my Arunachala. That is, she's rebuking Arunachala. Uh, literally, this means, if not now uniting me, destroying me, is this manliness. What this implies is, and now that I'm willing to surrender myself entirely to you, if you do not unite me with yourself in inseparable oneness, thereby destroying me, is this your manliness? So this this is what uh, what uh, the devotee is praying to Arunachal in verse 9. Though her longing to be destroyed immediately, so th this verse 9 shows that she's fully ready to give herself to Arunachal. She, she's praying to him to come and destroy her, uh, to come and unite with her, thereby destroying her here and now. 
So she has so much intense longing. Not she doesn't. She's not ready to wait for us another moment longer. She wants him to come now itself to unite with her and destroy her. Um, but though her longing to be destroyed immediately is so intense, in the previous two verses and subsequent two verses, she laments the fact that she's still being dragged outwards by her Vishaya Vasanas, uh, the five sense thieves, and under their sway, her mind is running outwards and roaming about the world. So the, the, when, we, when we look at these verses very clearly, we can see that even in the most advanced state of surrender, this problem of the Vishaya Vasanas does not uh, does not cease. We, we, we continue having to struggle against our Vishaya Vasanas till the very end. And how do we struggle against them? We cannot fight the Vishaya Vasanas as such. We can, if we try and oppose the Vishaya Vasanas, we are giving our strength to them. So how do we fight these Vishaya Vasanas? Only by holding more and more firmly to ourselves, to our own being, I am. And whenever our attention gets swayed by the Vishaya Vasanas and goes outward, we have to bring it back. This is how we fight them, not by confronting them, but by uh, by refraining from being swayed by them, by clinging firmly to self-attentiveness. And whenever our attention goes away, we have to bring it back. So this battle would go on till the very end. So in verse 7, she prayed, Unaye matri oda dulatin mel urudia yerupai arunachala. Arunachala, may you be firmly on the mind so that it does not run deceiving you. That implies, Arunachala, may you, may you be or, uh, or remain or sit down or be seated or be enthroned firmly on my mind so that it does not run out towards other things under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas deceiving or cheating on you like a promiscuous wife. And then in, likewise in verse 8 she prayed, Arunachala, Arunachala, so that seeing you uninterruptedly, the mind which roams about the world subsides, show your beauty. That is only when he shows his beauty will we, his true beauty, the fullness of his beauty, will we finally be willing to, uh, to subside back within. So the implication of this, uh, this verse is, Arunachala, so that seeing or looking at you uninterruptedly, my mind, which by its very nature roams incessantly about the world under the sway of its Vishaya Vasanas, so that this mind subsides or settles or submits or ceases entirely and forever in you, uh, thereby being brought under the sway of your grace. That is, now we're under the, when we allow our attention to go outwards, we're under the sway of our Vishaya Vasanas. When our attention is drawn back within, we're under the sway of his grace. So, so that it may be, uh, it may subside in you and thereby be brought under the sway of your grace. Show me your beauty. That is the infinite beauty of your real nature, which is unlimited, unalloyed and unceasing happiness. Um, and then after pleading with him in verse 9 to unite him, her with himself immediately, thereby destroying her, in verse 10 she rebukes him for allowing her to be dragged outwards by others, namely Vishaya Vasanas. That means, Arunachala, why this sleep when others are dragging me? Is this beauty for you? So again, this implies Arunachala, why this pretended sleep? Because obviously Arunachala is not really sleeping, he's just pretending sleep. Why this pretended sleep? Seeing what is happening to me, but remaining unconcerned, as if you did not see it, like one who is asleep. When others, that, that those others, they have no right over me, namely Vishaya Vasanas, uh, 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 and they rise at likes, dislikes, desires, fears, and so on. So when these others are dragging me, attracting or, or luring me outwards, away from you, my rightful Lord, why are you pretending to sleep? 
uh, is this beauty for you? That, in other words, does this become you? Is this befitting you? And for the same reason, in this uh, 11th verse that we're discussing now, uh, she rebukes him. I'm Bula Kalva, Ahatilni Pohumbo, Dahatilni Ilea Arunachala. Arunachala, when the five sense thieves, namely the Sheabathanas, enter my heart to steal my attention away from you, are you not in my heart? So why do you not protect me from them? Therefore, as these five verses illustrate, no matter how intensely we may yearn to surrender ourselves completely and immediately, until we are actually destroyed by our natula, the clear light of pure awareness, our Bishaya Vasanas will continue striving to drag our attention outwards, thereby stealing it away from him to whom it rightfully belongs. So we, th this warfare is always going on. It has to become more and more intense. Now, for most of us, it's still going on rather half-heartedly. We haven't wholly committed ourselves to this war. But as we go deeper and deeper in this practice, we're committing ourselves to this war more and more. And we have to see this war through to the very end. Because only when this, when we see this war through to the end, and as, as the war nears its conclusion, it will become more and more intense, as Bhagavan illustrated in these five verses that I've just talked about. So that is why Bhagavan prays in verse 74, show me this warfare, because there's no way of getting around it. We all have to experience this warfare, because without going through this warfare, we cannot reach our goal, which is the total annihilation of ego and all its vasanas. But in this war, we have to play our part. And how we have to play our part in this war being fought by grace against ego and its vast army of Bishaya Vasanas is clearly explained by Bhagavan in the 10th and 11th paragraphs of Nana. Um, I won't read the Tamil, I'll just read the English meaning of these two paragraphs. In the 10th paragraph, he says, even through those Vishaya Vasanas, which come from time immemorial, rising countless numbers like ocean waves, they will all be destroyed when Swarupa Dhyana increases and increases. Swarupa Dhyana means, literally means meditation or contemplation on our real nature. In other words, it implies self-attentiveness. Uh, so as self-attentiveness increases and increases, all these vasanas will be destroyed. Uh, when he says increases and increases, it, he means increases in, uh, in duration, in depth, and in intensity. So the, the, the only the, the, the part we have to play in this war is trying more and more to hold on to self-attentiveness. In other words, holding on to, to Bhagavan in our heart, because he is Swarupa. He is that which is shining in our heart as I am. So we need to hold on to him in our heart. And then in the next sentence, he says, without giving room even to the doubting thoughts, so many uh, vasanas ceasing or being dissolved, is it possible to be only as Swarupa, my own real nature? So without giving room even to that doubting thought, it is necessary to cling tenaciously to Swarupa Dhyana. He says that very, very firmly, in, I mean, very emphatically in, in, um, in Tamil. Swarupa dhyanate bidha pidiai pidikavendum. It's very difficult to convey in English the, the force with which Bhagavan is saying that. Uh, I translated bidha pidiai pidika as uh, uh, to cling tenaciously. But what Bida means is an adverb meaning uh, it, uh, without ceasing, without letting go. Uh, PDI is another adverb that means clinging, clingingly. So unleavingly, clingingly, clinging is, is what it means. So Bida, uh, PDI, uh, um, I translated as tenaciously because that's the best word in, we can have in English, but it doesn't fully convey the force with which Bhagavan is saying it in Tamil. There's a verse in uh, Guru Vachika Kavai where Bhagavan says something to the effect, but if we want to be saved, 
we need to cling like an udumbu uh, uh, to ourself in the heart. Udumbu is a is a Tamil name for a, a particular type of uh, I think it's a monitor lizard. Anyway, it's a it's a lizard. It's a very it's a large lizard that uh, uh, um, lives in um, in uh, South Asia, and it is. Uh, it is uh, notable for its ability to cling to any surface. So it's able to climb up a wall or climb up a rock face uh, by, by the suction in its pad. So uh, Bhagavan says we need to cling to self-attentiveness so firmly. That's what he implies here by saying, Sarupa dhyanate vidha pidi pidika vendam. So what he says in the sense, as I say, without giving room even to a doubting thought, uh, is it possible to put an end to all the vasanas and remain as Swarupa? There are so many vasanas. How can we put an end to them all? Without even giving room to that thought, we just need to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. That is, this is sraddha. This is the real meaning of sraddha. Sraddha is often translated as faith, but it means the strength of conviction. We need to be so firmly convinced that our salvation lies only in knowing and being what we actually are. And we can know and be what we actually are only by clinging to self-attentiveness. So this is true sraddha. And then in the third and last sentence of this, um, of this uh, uh, paragraph, his 10th paragraph, he says, um, however great a sinner one may be, if instead of lamenting and weeping, I am a sinner, how am I going to be saved? If one completely rejects the thought that one is a sinner, and is zealous or steadfast in, uh, in Swarupa Dhyana, in self-attentiveness, one will certainly be reformed. <coughs> uh, the word he said for reformed is Urupadovan. That means reformed or transformed. It implies we'll be transformed into what we actually are. We'll be transformed into our own form, Swarupa, is it, the implication. Um, so, what Bhagavan is not is saying here, he's not saying that we are not sinners, as ego is a great sinner. Bhagavan, when he was asked about the Christian doctrine of original sin, he said, yes, ego itself is the original sin. So ego is the sinner. The sinner is the original sin. Without a sinner, there can be no sin. So ego is the original sin. So Bhagavan is not saying that we are not sinners, but though we, as ego, we are great sinners, however great a sinner we may be, we should not give room, we should not dwell on the thought that we are a sinner, because that's again a, a false identification. I am a sinner. We're identifying who is the sinner, the, the, the body speech, whatever sin is and is actions, improper actions, immoral actions. Um, so the, the actions are done by mind, speech or body. Only when we identify ourselves with the mind, speech and body, do we feel I am the doer and do we consequently feel I'm the sinner? So we should, though it's true, as ego, we are great sinners. We shouldn't give room to the thought that we are a sinner. We should cling to, because this ego, the sinner, is unreal. What is real? What, the reality of ego is only I am. I am alone is real. So we should cling only to I am, to our own being, our own swarupa. And uh, then the, the sinner and all its sins, that is ego and all its pashaya of our sinners, will drop off. And so, as Bhagavan makes clear in these two paragraphs, I've just finished the tenth paragraph, but in this, this, in these two paragraphs, Bhagavan makes it clear, this warfare, though it's being fought by grace, we have our part to play in it. We need to play our little part by clinging tenaciously to Swarupa Dhyana. Um, and then in the eleventh paragraph, he says, uh, as long as Vishaya Vasanas exist in the mind, so long the investigation, who am I, is necessary. What he refers to here as Nana Innam Vicharane, the investigation, who am I, is the same practice that he was referring to in the previous paragraph of Swarupa Dhyana. That is, we can, we can investigate what we are only by attending to ourselves. And attending to ourselves is what he called Swarupa Dhyana. So to say he's using slightly different words, but the same subject, same practice he's talking about. And then in the second sentence, he says, as and when thoughts appear, 
then and there it is necessary to annihilate them all by vicharana in the very place from which they rise. Vicharana means investigation. It, it implies in this context self-investigation, investigation who am I. Um, uh, so it means uh, keen self-attentiveness. So how to destroy all these vasanas? That is, when he says, as and when thoughts appear, what is it that appears as thoughts? It's the vasanas. The vasanas are the inclinations that give rise to the thoughts. So the, the, the thoughts in their seed form are vishaya vasanas. So as and when thoughts appear, then it is there, it is necessary to annihilate all of them all by the charana in the very place from which they rise. So here he's emphasizing two things, as and when they appear and in the very place they arise. That is, how do we annihilate them as and when they appear and in the very place from which they arise? That is, as soon as they begin to rise, then and there we have to annihilate them. How do we do so? Only by clinging firmly to self-attentiveness, because the vasanas, though they're constantly trying to rise, they can develop into full-blown thoughts only if we allow our attention to be swayed by them. If we begin to follow them, then we get carried away and the, the, what began as of sprouting of a seed grows into a full, in, in, a, in a moment it grows into a fully developed uh, plant. And then one leads to another, leads to another, and we get carried away by a chain of thoughts. So in order to destroy them in, then and there, in the very, in the very moment they arise, in the very place where they arise, we have to cling firmly to self-attentiveness. That's what he implies here. And then in the next uh, sentence, he says, not attending to anything other is veragya or nirasa. Anything other, uh, anyate, that means anything, it implies anything other than ourself. So not attending to anything other than ourself. In other words, not allowing our attention to move away from ourself, that is veragya, uh, which means dip, dispassion or detachment or nirasa, which means desirelessness. The, the, Bairagi and nirasa mean the same. He's just using two terms that have the same meaning. Um, so not attending to anything other than ourself is vairagya or nirasa. Not leaving or letting go of oneself is jnana. Jnana means a true knowledge or real awareness. So not let not attending to anything other than ourself is vairagya. Not letting go of ourself is jnana. So what what does that mean? Not attending to other be how do we avoid attending to other things by holding on to ourself? If we let go of ourself, then we're attending to other things. So in the next sentence he says, in truth, uh two are just one. What he means by that is, in truth, these two, namely Vairagya and Jnana, they are one. Because if we're not letting go of ourself, we are thereby not attending to anything else. So they're one and the same thing. Um, so how, how, can we, how can we avoid attending to other things? Only by holding on to ourselves. And then in the next sentence, he gives an analogy. Just as pearl divers tying stones to their waist and sinking, pick up pearls that are found at the bottom of the ocean, so each one, sinking deep within oneself with their agia, uh, that is freedom from desire to be aware of anything other than oneself, may attain atmamutu. Atmamutu means the uh, self-pearl, or the pearl that is oneself. Um, so just like divers are, are, are sinking into the ocean to retrieve the pearls from the bottom, we are sink by holding on to self-attentiveness, holding firmly to self-attentiveness, we are sinking deep within ourselves, and thereby we can attain the pearl that is ourself. And then in the next sentence, he says, if, uh, this is a very important sentence, Oruvan, um, Tan sarupate adeyum varil, nirantara swarupa smaranaye, kai patru vanayin, adu andre podum. If one clings fast to uninterrupted swarupa smarana until one attains swarupa, that alone is sufficient. Swarupa smarana 
means remembrance of one's real nature. Our real nature is I am, the fundamental awareness I am. So Swarup and Smarana means self-remembrance. So if we cling fast to uninterrupted self-remembrance, until we attain Swarupa, until we attain our own real nature, that alone is sufficient. So Swarupa Smarana is basically, it means the same as Swarupa Dhyana. It means attending to ourself. So what he implies here is whatever else we may be doing, whatever actions of mind, speech, or body may be going on, we should always be trying to remember ourselves, trying to remember that fundamental awareness I am. Because whatever else we are aware of, we are always aware I am. But because of our interest in other things, we are overlooking this awareness I am. So holding on to uninterrupted Srupa Smarana means never letting this remembrance of this fundamental awareness I am slip from our memory, slip from our mind. And, and if we do that, that alone is sufficient. So for anyone who says, oh, this is very difficult, all Bhagavan is asking us to do is to remember our own being, to remember I am. If we can hold on to that, that is sufficient. That will lead us to our goal. Um, and then in the next two sentences, he, um, whereas the previous, the Pearl Diver analogy, he explained what the analogy meant. This, the analogy he gives in the last two sentences, he doesn't explain the analogy, but we can clearly understand what he's implying from the context. What the last two sentences literally mean is, so long as enemies are within the fortress, they will continuously uh, they will be continuously coming out from it. If one is continuously cutting down uh, or, or destroying all of them, as and when they come, the fortress will be captured. So what what does he mean here? What are these enemies, and what is the fortress? The fortress is the fortress of our heart. The enemies, who are, the enemies who have occupied this fortress are our Vishaya Vasanas. Ego and its army of Vishaya Vasanas, they've occupied the fortress. So now we are besieging this fortress, trying to, trying to recapture this fortress, our own heart, from these uh, enemies who've taken control of it. So long as they remain in the fortress of our heart, they are not they they have no food and water there they have to come out for food and water the food and water that they depend upon for their survival is our attention so they come out trying to capture our attention so how can we cut them down only by not attending by not by not attending to the vishayas that they try to make us attend to um so uh to the extent to which we cling firmly to self-attentiveness, we are thereby yielding ourselves to his grace. So this is all we need do to cooperate with his grace in this war that it is fighting against our enemy, the army of Bishaya Vasanas that has occupied and taken possession of the fortress of our heart. By clinging to self-attentiveness, we are forcing the Bishaya Vasanas to come out, seeking to gain our attention which is the food and water on which they depend for their survival. And if we do not allow our attention to be, di uh, uh, to be diverted by them, away from ourselves, we are thereby cutting them down as and when they come out. Um, so th this is all we have to do. We have to hold on to self-attentiveness more and more. The more we hold on to self-attentiveness, the more the vasanas will try to come out because they need to come out to capture our attention. But if we, instead of allowing our attention to be diverted by them, if we hold on firmly to self-attentiveness, they will, that is what Bhagavan means by cutting them down. They'll grow weaker and weaker and weaker. But the weaker they grow, the more fiercely they will fight. So the, the, the battle will continue till the very end. That's why even though Bhagavan is in this Akshramla, he's depicting the state of, of, of a devotee who's ready to surrender herself completely here and now, to be destroyed here and now, still she has to battle against her Vishaya Vasanas. Still the Vishaya Vasanas are trying to drag her outwards. Um, so this is the challenge we're all up against. And so we 
clinging firmly to self-attentiveness more and more and more. This is the this is the only way to salvation. Our ultimate salvation can be achieved only by us doing our bit, clinging to self-attentiveness. Actually, everything is being done by grace, because without his grace, we wouldn't even have a, the slightest inclination to attend to ourselves. The fact that we at least want to try to attend to ourselves shows that grace is working in our heart. So we have to cooperate with grace by clinging to self-attentiveness more and more. And whenever we find ourselves to be too weak to resist being swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas, we can cry out in prayer with a yearning heart, as Bhagavan has taught us in this song. Because by praying in this way, we are strengthening our love to yield ourselves to his grace. That is, we are making ourselves more, the more we pray to him, the more we are depending on his grace. Uh, because it's only by the strength of his grace that we can hold on to self-attentiveness. Um, so there's no contradiction between the prayer and the effort to turn within. When we, are, when we feel ourselves too weak to turn within and hold on to self-attentiveness, we pray. And that prayer would restore our strength, restore our love to hold on to self-attentiveness. So praying to him with a, heart, with a melting heart can therefore be a great aid and support to us in our effort to cling firmly to self-attentiveness and thereby surrender ourselves entirely to him. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arnachala Ramanaya